very sorry that uh, we are beginning a bit late. Uh, this is a very special occasion. We have a very uh, distinguished speaker in our midst. I'd like to begin by introducing our speaker. Uh, Dr. Faisal Devji is University of Oxford's uh, reader in modern South Asian history. He has held faculty positions at New School in New York, Yale University, and the Chicago University. And he also has a PhD in intellectual history. Uh, he's the author of uh, some highly acclaimed books, Landscapes of the Jihad, Militancy, Morality, and Modernity, The Terrorist in Search of Humanity, Militant Islam, and Global Politics, The Impossible Indian, Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence, Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a political idea. Friends, some of us at ORF uh, had the good fortune of uh, interacting with Dr. Devji uh, a week ago. And uh, I believe that behind this uh, scholarship, uh, I mean, which really enriches his uh, scholarship, is the lived experience of the the syncretic uh, reality of South Asia. And that's what makes uh, him a very special speaker, in my opinion, uh, giving us this talk on Mahatma Gandhi, Hinduism, Islam, and nonviolence, lessons for India and the world. Uh, I would like uh, Sudhindra Kulkarni, our chairman, to start with the, his opening remarks, after which we will hear Dr. Devji. So Devji, friends, I'll be very brief. Uh, you started late and I'm as keen as all of you are to listen to Professor Devji's talk. I will begin by conveying to all of you Ram Naomi greetings and I am doing so because it has a significance to the topic of uh, today's talk. Ram, the king of Ayodhya, the meaning of Ayodhya, Ayudh, is no war. So Ram stood for peace. Ram stood for an ethos of no conflict, no killing. This is also the basic credo of Islam. Islam stands for peace, for mercy, for compassion. And in Mahatma Gandhi, we see a personality who identified himself fully with the ethical, the ethical core, ethical message of both Hinduism and Islam. He never tired of saying that I am a proud Hindu, but his Hinduism, it embraced Islam, it embraced all other religions of the world. He is one leader who spoke of Ram Raj, but he says that Ram Raj for me is not Hindu Raj. Ram Raj is Divine Raj, the Kingdom of God. And in Dr. Faisal Devji, as you will soon see, we have a scholar who is doing some truly amazing, truly original research in understanding, understanding Gandhi, Gandhi's philosophy of violence, non-violence. As, as uh, Radha mentioned, by, by placing him in the syncretic, in the plural ethical traditions of India or a South Asian, South Asian region. 
non violence you know you might have seen the the short text about the talk his contention is that gandhi champions non violence not by rejecting or running away from violence but by confronting violence in such a way as to convert violence into non violence into love there is a very profound thought in gandhi ji's writings where he says that non violence is the moral equivalent of war non violence is the moral equivalent of war which means that he is for waging a war i mean he he for him non violence is not some inactive passive pacifism it is a very active confrontation but a confrontation to change transform violence in our society and in ourselves into non violence we are going to hear all this and of course much much more from professor dev ji uh, it's only the second time that i'm meeting him but uh, friends i want to tell you that i have found a truly great original thinker in dr dev ji you know india and the world of scholarship awaits a lot lot more from you professor dev ji uh, you have already written four books but uh, you know given the depth of your scholarship and the way you think you are going to make a major contribution to the debate in india in our neighborhood and in the world as a whole on religion and especially our two great religions hinduism and islam one last point friends you know he told me just now that all his books all his four books they were written in mumbai <laughs> uh he chooses mumbai you know he does all his research but uh, he comes to mumbai to write his books including the latest the impossible indian gandhi and the temptation of violence he in some ways belongs to this city so we are very happy to have you professor and uh, this is just the beginning of uh, our association the association of uh, observer research foundation with you we hope that this association will continue and uh, we have requested professor to give the text of his talk which we will publish thank you very much and over to you words um which are especially meaningful for me because i have been a, a great admirer of sudindra kokarni's work over the last number of years and it is a particular pleasure to have finally met you um you know in uh, hind swaraj uh, gandhi's first great work uh, of 1909 when he comes to describing uh, communal what today you might call communal violence or the conflict in particular between hindus and muslims he says something characteristic of him uh which is to say something rather puzzling uh he says this conflict is a result of luxury the reason we fight is because we can afford to fight um it's a kind of pleasure we take in it it's a luxury what does he mean by this it's a luxury because unlike those partisans of law and order for whom violence is seen as representing an excess of responsibility right violence means that people have too much agency too much responsibility they must be restrained by law for gandhi the opposite was true that is precisely because indians both hindus and muslims 
had no responsibility over their own lives and societies in colonial times. It is precisely because of this that they fought, that they could afford to fight, that fighting was a form of luxury because they all knew secretly that the colonial state was there to pick up the pieces, that they, could, they had no responsibility over their own societies and uh, the future of this society. Therefore, why not fight? Uh, in, in suggesting this, I think he was arguing that the role of the state, any state, he was speaking about the colonial state, but he could have been speaking of any other state. Uh, of course, it's an important role that a state plays. But the machinery of law and order, the machinery that is about preventing people's actions and putting limits on their agency, he thought produced violence as much as prevented it. Uh, but more than, as it were, the lack of responsibility over one's own social future uh, as a motivation for violence, Gandhi thought that the state, any state, but of course he was speaking about the colonial state, makes for violence, permits it, not deliberately, necessarily, not intentionally, but by its very presence. You know, we have this um, view, which, is, which Gandhi also entertained, of um, the policy of divide and rule. But rather than attributing divide and rule to some kind of malign and malicious intention on the part of the British, Gandhi saw it as a structural phenomenon. The British didn't have to want it. It just happened. It happened because of the way in which modern politics is set up. How is it set up? You have a state that wields law and order, the machinery of law and order. This state sets itself up as the neutral arbiter, as the third party. To which all other elements in society must turn. And for Gandhi, what this suggested was that categories like Hinduism and Islam, Hindus and Muslims, only become socially defined as interests uh, because you have the state there as a neutral third party. It makes them possible. So in Hind Swaraj, he says, Look, what's happening? We can afford to fight because we have no responsibility over our own futures. The British will pick up the pieces. Instead of listening to what the British say, which is Indians are so violent, we must therefore continue to be in India and stop them from being so violent. What we should say is Indians should be given even more responsibility. Should be made, should not be made, should themselves take responsibility for their own futures. When they confront each other, they should confront each other in full responsibility, which means they are in charge of their own futures. Once they are in charge of their own futures, then only can you have nonviolence. Then only can you have appropriate negotiations. Right. Um, so it's not only the fact that the state prevents you from exercising responsibility, but also because it serves as a mediator. Right? So Gandhi will say, look what religious conflict is about in this country. Hindus or Muslims will do something and, and irk the state into acting in a certain way, and then the other party will try to do the same thing. Always mediated through the state. Right. He uses very homegrown examples of how this situation manifests itself. And a religious conflict is only one aspect of it. Right? Gandhi doesn't think that's peculiar. So famously in Hind Swaraj, he talks about doctors and lawyers. Right? Remember, he's a lawyer himself. Right? So Gandhi will say, and I'm sure a number of you will know this, that he has this, a nice, he has very homespun examples. So he'll say, what does modern medicine do? You overeat. You have a stomach ache, you go and take a pill, a tablet from the doctor, um, your stomach ache goes, and you overeat again, and so the process goes on. 
by relying upon modern medicine, which is of course processed, guaranteed, set in place by the state, by the colonial state, you actually become dependent on the system and you don't address the real problem, which is your own greed, your own gluttony. If you suffer your stomach ache, then only if you confront it, then only will you be capable of taking control of your own body and your own desires. Right. That the placebo effect, the effect of medicine, actually subordinates your body uh, to a system which is guaranteed by the state. Right. Doctors are licensed, etc. Similarly, lawyers, he says, are there to perpetuate, so doctors or modern forms of medicine are there to perpetuate illness right, and, and not to address its real cause. And when you become a patient, you literally give over control of your own body to the doctor. And in the case of colonial India, the doctor represented the state as well. Right? So you literally become a colonized individual by your own will not because someone has forced you to do something. Similarly with lawyers, what do lawyers do in his estimation? They thrive upon conflict um, and they reach various kinds of deals and agreements. Again, the state is instrumental uh, and it prevents people from actually confronting each other with a full sense of responsibility for their own actions. Compared to doctors and lawyers, or counterposed to doctors and lawyers, uh, Gandhi places the figure of the soldier. Interesting, because you think that here is Gandhi, the apostle of nonviolence. Why should he see the soldier as being an ideal of society? But he does. Why? Doctors and lawyers and their professions are not just run by the state, as, are, as is the profession of a soldier, but they are mediated through money. They are about all kinds of things of that sort. The soldier cannot be driven in these ways because the soldier is obliged to risk his own life. Once you're obliged to risk your own life, your actions are no longer defined by self-interest uh, or by the interest even of the government. Right? They have to be defined by great moral virtues or they should be defined. Bravery, courage, glory, all of these things which are meant to be soldierly characteristics, um, they really make the soldier into a moral being even when he is the servant of the state. Right? Um, now, when Gandhi wrote this, all of this uh, stuff that I've been describing in Hind Swaraj, what I think he was doing was trying to think about communal relations in structural terms all right? by saying, look, Hindu-Muslim conflict is about many things. One of the things that determines it is the way in which the modern state structures Indian society. And you can see the same logic operating in other aspects of life, therefore doctors and lawyers, as opposed, say, to soldiers. All right? The state creates interest groups. Without the state, they could not exist. Right. Uh, and once religious groups become interest groups, something perverse has happened. Right. Think to yourselves about, you know, we are going through uh, one of these periodic exercises, great democratic exercises, the elections, right? Think about the language of politics. The language of politics is all about interest or self-interest. Uh, Indian society is divided up on television into every kind of fraction and fragment imaginable. Caste, community, region, language, class, gender, etc., etc., etc. Whatever kind of fraction is possible, uh, it, whatever kind of fragment it's possible to think of exists on television, in, in analysis, etc. But the great contradiction, of course, has always been, and this is something that Gandhi real, realized, while the language of politics is all about interest or self-interest, the reality of Indian society is in fact quite different. Uh, so much of it is about 
let's say, sacrifice, as Gandhi might say. So Gandhi's point is always, look around you. Even at the heart of political self-interest, you find sacrifice. Just as even at the heart of everyday relations, you find sacrifice. Parents sacrifice for their children, children sacrifice for their parents, wives and husbands sacrifice for each other. People die in demonstrations, in riots. They don't go there intending to die. Their deaths and other forms of sacrifice cannot really be factored into or be seen as part of self-interest. So you have this great contradiction. On the one hand, Indian politics, like no other politics in the world, is determined by various forms of self-interest. We count it up. Right? It's almost as if ideas are absent. Ideas are seen only as being part of interest or interest groups. And yet, at the same time, for a lengthy period, you have, together with the language of self-interest that Gandhi said is created by the state in its colonial manifestation initially, um, you have forms of disinterest or, shall we say, sacrifice. This contradiction was reflected upon by Indian thinkers from the early 20th century. So when you look at someone like Dr. Ambedkar, for instance, he would say against Gandhi, he says, look, the problem with Gandhi and Gandhiism is that it refuses to take interest seriously. It wants love, trust, all of these things. And for Ambedkar, what this means is that Gandhian philosophy creates human action that is either sublime, it is above self-interest, or it's barbarous, it's below self-interest, it is absolutely brutal. And he thinks this is because Gandhi refuses to take interest or self-interest seriously. This is a classical way of thinking. You know, when you look at a European political philosopher like Hobbes, right, there's a great anxiety in early modern European thought uh, because without people being invested in something, property generally, but a community, an ideal, they are seen as being loose cannons. Right? Uh, they can run amok. Only once you have self-interest, I have a bit of land, I have a family, I have a building, I have whatever it is, right? a ta tax break, a tax shelter, uh, that determines me as a form, as a, uh, that determines my self-interest. Right? Uh, so people have to be taught to become interested, uh, to identify as capitalists or communists or Hindus or Muslims or whatever it is, or men and women for that matter. Gandhi refuses to make a qualitative distinction. This is crucial. We often talk about communalism as, it is, as if it is qualitatively different from everything else. But Gandhi, who is a universalistic thinker, one of his skills is to bring things that appear to be quite different together and to show you how they participate in the same kind of logic. All right. So whereas Ambedkar and also Jinnah think that Indian society is not self-interested enough, right? that you really need to separate it out in such a way as to create proper political interests. Gandhi, like Muhammad Iqbal, um, is more interested in the sacrificial and disinterested forms of Indian social life. Right? Because neither of these figures thinks that you can really wipe the slate clean and replace Indian history and civilization with propertied forms of interest and contract. Right? That the idea that the entirety of Indian society might be composed of people who are contracting with each other and making deals with each other who are self-interest of various kinds, group or individual, both Iqbal and Gandhi thought this was impossible and indeed undesirable, that the genius of Indian civilization lay in another direction. And so Gandhi keeps on pointing back to what he considers the truly universal aspect of moral life, sacrifice. All right. uh, and there are many words for this we can go into, uh, depending on the sacrifice uh, 
uh, yagya, of course, the ritual sacrifice, but tyag or prayaschit or there are others, right? Or indeed shahadat, right? Gandhi uses that word also, right? Which is a Muslim and a Sikh uh, term which has religious meaning. Now, when making this analysis, Gandhi, um, and I'm afraid I'm being a bit dry at the moment, but it'll become uh, somewhat more interesting soon, I hope. Uh, Gandhi says, is basically saying, these forms of conflict, which are built out of the attempt to make interests and interest groups, um, are structural. And they are not historical. So whereas interest groups are often made using the language of history, in fact, inevitably using the language of history, right? think of any community or communal, uh, whether it's, I'm not using the word communal in its Indian sense here as something necessarily bad, but any form of community identity in modern times is inevitably historical. Right, you refer back to the past, you think about the horrible things that have happened to you in the past, uh, and the past comes into the present and moves into the future. Right? In a way, history is a way of thinking about your present, but also of determining the future. Right? A thousand years of, let's say, Hindu-Muslim conflict, um, how do we deal with this? This allows us to think of a future. For Gandhi, history is of, he thinks history is a completely Western thing. He doesn't like it. He thinks it makes for vicarious identities. People read books and they get angry. They have not experienced any of these things themselves. Uh, and um, uh, history, he thinks, is simply a record of violence. Right. Violence is what is visible. Violence is what history is made out of. History books cannot be written without it. Nonviolence, on the other hand, for Gandhi has no history. If you actually try to make it visible, it disappears. You do violence to it. Right? Because he says over and over again, look, there might be a thousand years of violence, but no society can exist which is not based on nonviolence. Because nonviolence is the dark matter of all life and all society. Right? Um, but it exists only because we don't see it, because it has no history. Uh, to make it visible is to betray it. And Gandhi used to use a phrase which, interestingly, Iqbal also used the exact same phrase, invisible points of contact. You know, he would say, for instance, you know, in his last uh, days, his prayer meetings, when he was reading the Gita and the Quran often together, and people would object, and he would say, Fine, you can object. What strikes you as being different about the Quran or being different about the Gita, depending on who you were, Hindu or Muslim, what is visible to you is only what is different. But you never ask yourself what is actually similar. He says, is mercy common to this, to these two texts? Is love common to these two texts? Is truth, satya, is that common to these two texts? You must understand these invisible points of contact, because that is what makes life and relations and society. It is not the visible, it is the invisible. By making it visible, as I said, you end up betraying it in various ways. Um, it must be the dark matter of life. It must be how you live without thinking about it. And only that kind of life uh, can be described as nonviolent. So he says over and over again, look, Nonviolence as a term is negative. Nonviolence, as in Sanskrit, ahimsa. Himsa is a positive word. It means something. It's visible. Ahimsa depends upon himsa. Right? It's a negative term. This is not to say that it is somehow weaker. On the contrary, what this means is that it's the invisible nature of nonviolence that makes it so powerful. Um, it also means that himsa and ahimsa are tied together. The only way in which you can have nonviolence, 
possible is because it has links to its opposite, to violence. The conversion from one to the other is only possible if they're already tied together in some way, and I'll come back to this point. Right? So Gandhi's not opposing them. He, of course, prefers one over the other, but he, noted, he notes that the two are actually inextricably linked. You cannot move from one to the other if they are not linked. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, what that link is in a while. But to, to return to history and the way it determines the present and the future, now this is again Gandhi's famous um, uh, uh, theory that one should not sacrifice uh, means for ends. Right? Uh, so instead of thinking about the future and what you need to do and sacrificing the means for it, right, uh, you must actually forget about the future and concentrate only on the present, concentrate only on the, on the means. You must sacrifice the ends for the means. And he has a beautiful way of putting this. He says, look, when we think historically, and we think that our present and our future are at the end of a long chain of conflicts or whatever, all right, then you are already narrowing the possibilities that lead to that future. You are trying to make the future, but you never can. No one ever really can. Sometimes even when you succeed in making the future you think you want, there are all kinds of unintended consequences that destroy it for you. Right? I mean, a good example for this which he cites himself is of the war of the Mahabharata. Virtue wins. The Pandavas win. But what kind of a victory is it? You, you know, I'm sure, what happens to them. It's quite depressing at the end. They're not all happy. Right? Uh, it's... Um, it's a grave moment. Uh, they don't expect it. They were right. Those who won were right. But the consequences of the war were inadvertent in some sense. For Gandhi, therefore, focusing on the present, morality, he thinks, is only possible in the present. You must not think about the future. You must not think about consequences. He takes this teaching from the Gita, of course. Right? You must do your dharma, your duty, and you must not consider the fruits of your action, nishkam karma. Right? Um, and he puts this quite nicely by suggesting that this is the only way in which we can attend to the incarnation, in the incarnation of Vishnu. Now notice how this e explicitly religious way of speaking also has completely, as it were, philosophical and non-religious meaning. Because what he's saying is the following. When we have a kind of historical sensibility that wants to understand the present by the past and shape the future in a controlling way, in a way that sacrifices means for ends, then we give away the possibility of receiving the incarnation. Because what is there in every history is the incalculable. Something that you cannot calculate and produce. The incalculable always exists as a possibility, and that is the divine possibility. An incarnation is always unexpected. You can't predict it. You can't make it happen. Right? It's only your tapasya, your renunci, your penance that might provide the context. But it has to be unexpected. To focus only on morality in the present and to leave the future is to actually leave the future more open. Uh, and that he describes as attending to the avatar, right? to the in incarnation which can be seen as the incarnation of Vishnu or it can be seen in completely prosaic and indeed even atheistic ways as future openness. Right? He thinks that that is what is divine. Now, I will move on to uh, saying something about a couple of instances of, of this rather abstract set of ideas that I've been presenting so far. But let me do so by returning to the text of the Bhagavad Gita. All right. um, you know, I'm sure, uh, the occasion of this text the two armies are drawn up on a battlefield. Arjuna, the great hero, 
is driven by his charioteer Krishna to that no man's land between the two armies it belongs neither here nor there and there the great bow slips from Arjuna's grasp he's despondent he sits down he says to Krishna how can I fight these are my relatives my preceptors my friends on the other side what does it mean and Krishna as I'm sure you all know counsels him to fight by talking about the doctrine of um, Nishkam Karma, right? Of desireless action, of attending precisely to the present, as Gandhi said, of having one's decisions determined by Dharma, your duty as you understood it, depending on who you are, and not by trying to control the future. Because this is the wonderful thing about the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Because for Arjuna, choice has been rendered irrelevant and superfluous here. Think about moral philosophy. Right? Modern moral philosophy, European moral philosophy, often is of this kind that's about choice and interest. Right? Um, what should one do? How should one do it? And the battlefield war is always the sign of it, the negation of morality. Look what Gandhi does. He takes the battlefield as a site of morality. Generally, it is the virtuous city. It's Ayodhya, in a certain estimation, that is the site of moral life. For Gandhi, even Ayodhya, even Ram Raja, is the site of sacrifice. Because Ram Raja is about the sacrifice of Rama. For Sita, for Kush and love. It's a sacrifice of Sita for her husband and for her children. It's a sacrifice of all of these central figures. It's not about pleasure, right? It is not about satisfied virtue. Uh, so even, even the victory of Rama after the defeat of Ravan is in fact about um, sacrifice. All right? um, but Kurukshetra is even more the site of sacrifice. So whereas Western moral philosophy will never take the battlefield as a moral ideal, for the Gita, it is the moral ideal. And for Gandhi, it is particularly the moral ideal because on the battlefield, all ideas of self-interest are put at risk and collapse. Uh, because death is what stares you in the face. When you're facing your own death, what does self-interest mean? Uh, for Gandhi, the battlefield is a site where politics simul simultaneously reaches its apogee. Right? It is the most political moment. And yet, it is also the moment when politics is defeated. How? Ask Arjuna. Arjuna is there on the battlefield and Krishna tells him, what does it matter if you go or if you stay? According to Gandhi, right? In Gandhi's commentary. If you go, people will die. If you stay, people will die. There might be different people, but it's irrelevant. Right? You cannot make a decision on this battlefield as a result of interest or choice. Right? This is not Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill. Whatever you do, there's going to be a slaughter. So how do you make a decision? The battlefield is the testing ground for morality itself. And so for Gandhi, if you couldn't be moral on the battlefield, then morality was nowhere. It was not universal. The irony is, politics, the politics of self-interest, which claims universality, actually fails on the battlefield. One, because these kinds of choices cannot be made. You can only decide to do out of dharma, not because you think something is going to happen, because you can control the future. All right. um, but m more than this, for Gandhi, sacrifice rather than interest or self-interest is important because it, he thinks, is more democratic than choice. How? Think about moral philosophy again, Th that of the utilitarian kind, right? You must have informed choice. How do you make a moral decision? You must know something, right? Knowledge is the criterion. For Gandhi, this automatically makes it particular rather than universal because it creates a hierarchy. In other words, the more educated you are, the more moral you are. If choice is dependent on knowledge, then ignorant people are less moral, right? So men, Educ educated 
wealthy men are the most moral individuals and uneducated women, let's say, are by definition excluded from morality or from the proper exercise of morality. So knowledge cannot be the criterion for morality because it destroys the universality of it. And Gandhi will often say, for instance, when people tell him about riots in the Muslim rights, he says, I don't need to know what happened in order to know what to do. I don't need to know who did this and how this happened because I must make my decision on the basis of my dharma. Right. Knowledge is not the criterion of moral action, as it was not for Arjuna. It's not like he was sitting there in his chariot thinking, hmm, let me think, you know, what, what could be done. Of course, in a war, these things are thought. But at that moment, Krishna, who of course is the great plotter and trickster, after all, he makes plots all the time. It is Krishna, the very man, the very uh, uh, deity, who is the most expert at making plans, tells Arjuna not to. All right? That you must only fight um, in the way your dharma dictates. More than this, and this is Gandhi's great point, I think, in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, he says, look, who are you fighting against? This is Gandhi taking on the voice of Krishna, right, to Arjuna. Who are these men, Drona, Bhishma, Karna? These are good men, but they are on the opposite side. Why are they on the opposite side? Not because they are evil, we know that they are good. Because they have made a promise, because they are loyal, because of friendship, because of many reasons, none of which are evil. Duryodhana's, the evil prince, Duryodhana's army can only survive because of virtue, not vice. So Duryodhana, you might think, is, the most, is evil because he's the most self-interested person. He has no, he's entirely amoral, right? He just wants power, glory, and all of these things. And Gandhi says, or he puts this into Krishna's mouth, he says, but that cannot really, that is nothing. Duryodhana's army does not hold together because of evil. It cannot. Just like Drona, Bhishma and Karna have reasons that are not Duryodhana's reasons in being part of that army, so too all of Duryodhana's men have to be motivated by virtues like sacrifice, like bravery, like friendship, like loyalty. These are, these are virtues. These are not vices. Whichever army you find them in, they are virtues. So Gandhi's point then is that even evil depends upon goodness. And it is because evil depends upon goodness that you can have the conversion from violence to nonviolence by withdrawing from evil. What in politics he calls non-cooperation, right? That's one way in which you withdraw. Uh, think about it. It's, I think it's quite extraordinary. Duryodhana's army would not survive for a single minute if the soldiers were not loyal, if they were not willing to sacrifice, if they did not entertain friendships amongst each other, just like if they did not feel a sense of duty, if they had not made a vow, just like Karna, Bhishma, Drona. Right? So evil depends upon goodness. It, Duryodhana cannot even control his own army in that sense. Even if he were to win, it would be a meaningless victory. Therefore, virtue is superior, and because virtue is superior, nonviolence is possible. Sacrifice is crucial here. Do you see how? It's not self interest, it's all of these other things. Arjuna is urged to sacrifice in fighting a war he does not want to fight. His enemies are performing a similar sacrifice, these names that I have mentioned of Bhishma, etc. Right. even though they are enemies, even though they are on the other side. So for Gandhi then, to return to my initial point, that communities like other act, social actors have become interests because of the state, because of the idea of a neutral third party, because of contract and all of these things. But Indian society has another reality to it, which is more powerful. And that is the reality of sacrifice. So if you have self-interest on the one side, you have self-sacrifice on the other. 
and Gandhi is forever pointing out that indeed all our human relations, even the most selfish among us, have moments of sacrifice in them. Right? Even if it is only part of a family. No family can survive without sacrifice of some kind. I don't mean necessarily the sacrifice of your life. Right? You will decide, look, I won't say anything even though I'm right because my brother or my sister will feel bad. Or I might not agree with my parents, but I will listen to them. Uh, or there are many such things. Silence is also a form of sacrifice. Right? So he sets up these two things. Self-interest, which is provides the vocabulary of politics in India, and self-sacrifice, which is its reality. Uh, and what Gandhi wants to do is to explore and elaborate the reality of sacrifice and make it into a moral a form of moral universality. Whereas what people like Jinnah and Abedka want to do, equally legitimate, right? I'm not saying one is good and one is bad necessarily, is they want to make Indian society even more self-interested. They think that by going further in that direction, you will actually have goodness emerge. You will have good contractual relations. You know, Jinnah's whole point is, for instance, that um, you know, Hindus and Muslims are too close. The difference with the West is very interesting, right? So, you know, for instance, in, a, in an interview with the Daily Herald, someone asks him, you know, what he thinks about Hindu-Muslim violence, and he says, well, um, the Hindus want to worship the cow and the Muslims want to eat it. Now, it's a joke. It's a typical Jinnah joke. But underneath that is a real point, which is that the problem he thinks with Hindus and Muslims is not that they are too far away from each other, but that they are too close to each other that they are too intimate to one another. So in another interview he says, look how we are. The hero of one is the villain of the other. If we were truly separated, <coughs> truly partitioned, it would be fine. But it's precisely because we are too close to each other that we feel betrayal. You don't feel betrayed by someone who is a stranger. You are only betrayed by someone who is your brother, someone who is intimate with you. And this is where the passion comes from. So Jinnah will say in 1946, when he's recommending partition, he says, look, I've dealt with this as a lawyer. Two brothers quarrel, the father has died. Two brothers quarrel, I partition the property. Once you partition the property, the brothers become friends. You move from brotherhood to friendship. Why? How? Through contract, to creating different interests. The, the chula, the stove is separated. The two families are, the property is separated. Now you can get along with each other, but no longer as brothers, right, as friends. And so, in a way, what he wants to do is to deal with the intimacy of Hindu-Muslim conflict, very foreign from the European version, which is all about uh, foreignness. I mean, think of anti-Semitism in Europe. More than a thousand years of it, of living together, and yet the Jews seen as being completely foreign and strange and outside. Not so in India. Even the greatest enmity is seen as being an intimate character, just as in the Gita, it is brothers and cousins who fight with one another. Right? It's, this is not a war, the war of the Mahabharata is not a war with some stranger, it's a war with your own people. That is what makes it passionate, that is what makes it morally problematic. And I, I would like to hazard a guess that the language of conflict and enmity in India, especially communal, is riven with these intimacies and these overlap, these forms of overlap. Right? That's what makes it rhetorically so passionate. Uh, and that's why Gandhi, when thinking about it, thinks through the Gita. Jinnah wants the partition because he wants self-interest and contract and friendship. And Jinnah wants, uh, Gandhi wants brotherhood. He wants more of it. He wants to take the intimacy and purify it. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to uh, get rid of it. He thinks it's an impossible and undesirable task to do. Furthermore, sacrifice, so that is why he sets up self-sacrifice against self-interest. And as uh, Mr. Kulkarni was saying, this form of recommending non-violence is of course of the most courageous kind, right? He's not running away. The Bhagavad Gita is not about running away. Arjuna is told, don't run away. You must fight. There's a reason why Gandhi chose this text. Um, you must confront. Uh, sacrifice is also crucial because for Gandhi it is the most democratic thing. 
just as I was saying earlier that any moral decision based upon knowledge is hierarchical because some people have more knowledge than others. But everyone can sacrifice something. Right? And if you look at Gandhi's forms of sacrifice, everyone can do them. They are both individual and collective. Think of them. There's fasting, there's spinning. Spinning is also a form of sacrifice. Spinning is, it's so interesting because everyone of course spins alone but you know you had these moments where hundreds were spinning together. So it's at the same time individual and sovereign you have responsibility for yourself and it's collective. The salt march. What was the salt march? People just walked. Walking became a form of protest and resistance and sovereignty. Again, it wasn't like an army marching in lockstep. People came and they left. Others joined and drifted off. Completely individual and yet collective. Right? Celibacy is another form which is more individual of course than collective just as fasting is. And death, finally. So there are all these forms of sacrifice that for Gandhi really made uh, Indian society what it was and made it resistant to a politics that is entirely based on self-interest which he thought was necessarily violent. Right? On the one hand visibility, conflict and violence, on the other hand invisibility, non-violence as a negative characterization. But the links between those two makes the conversion possible. Um, it is because evil is based on goodness that you can withdraw from it and become non-violent. Now, let me give you these two examples and then I'll close. So, so far I've been talking about the theory of it. Um, Gandhi's first great experiment, of course, in communal harmony is the Khilafat movement, which has been much condemned. Right? And you know what that was. At the end of the First World War, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which had sided with Germany, was uh, de defeated. And there was a great mobilization, uh, not really anywhere else in the Muslim world, but in India, uh, among Muslims, who thought that the caliph, the khalifa, the Ottoman sultan, should be, his rights should be protected, and his sovereignty over the holy places of the Muslim world in Mecca and Medina and in Iraq should be protected. So it was simultaneously an anti-colonial uh, movement because of course the British and the French were dividing up the Middle East between them. But it was also a religious movement and that's what attracted Gandhi. You know, normally historians tell us, ah, Gandhi is this clever banya and he's, he wants the Muslim, he wants the help of the Muslims. So he says, okay, fine, you are interested in, in, in the caliphate and so we'll go along with you and we'll do a deal. But when you read him, it's exactly the opposite of that. For Gandhi, What's great about Khilafat is precisely that it's irrational, <laughs> that it's not self-interested. Because he asked himself, what do the Indian Muslims gain? So what if the Ottoman Sultan is protected? What do they gain? They gain nothing. Therefore, this movement, which others saw as irrational, for Gandhi represented the ideal. It was idealistic. And it is because the Indian Muslims were, he thought, driven by an ideal and not by a self-interested reality that the whole of Indian politics could also become non-interested or disinterested. All right? So you know Muslim leaders come to Gandhi and say look if you support us if Congress and the Hindus support us then we will um, forego and forswear cow slaughter and Gandhi says no. So Gandhi says I think there is no one else in India who has more regard for cow protection than I do. But I will say no, because the relations between Hindus and Muslims cannot be determined by contract. That is self-interest. It cannot be a deal. No nation is put together by a deal. A contract is by its nature temporary. Once something has been achieved, then it, it, the, you know, it's broken. A nation is not the product of a contract. It's not a business dealing. So it's not a, uh, you know, a set of business dealings. And remember, Gandhi is a pro-business, right? He's not saying this because he's anti-capitalist in, in, in the kind of crude sense. Um, because he tells the Muslim leaders, you are driven by an ideal, we too can be driven by an ideal. So he tells Hindus, you must sacrifice 
you must support the Muslim demand and not ask for the ban on cow slaughter. If the Muslims voluntarily uh, ban it or desist from doing it, that's good, of course. But it cannot be a deal. Right? And even better, he says, you must, su you must support the Muslims, especially because you don't believe in the caliphate. Right? So normally you think of nations coming together because they all agree on something. For Gandhi, you don't have to. This is how friendship and brotherhood works. Right? As I was saying earlier, you might not agree with something your parents said, but you will keep quiet, you know, because that is more important. In this case, it is, in, it is the invitation of friendship. Right? So if a Hindu sacrifices by agitating for the caliphate, then he invites the friendship of Muslims. If the Muslim voluntarily relinquishes cow slaughter, then he or she invites the friendship of Hindus by a voluntary sacrifice, not a contractual relationship. That is what creates what he called heart unity. Right? So you move away as far away as you can from self-interest. It has to be about sacrifice. That is the way in which nations are made. Right? Um, and for Gandhi, of course, the relationship between Hindus and Muslims, because Dharma, of course, is not like a modern legal subject, right? It's not, there's no one size fits all. Because he thought Hindus and Muslims were equal, their relationship must be defined by what he called mitrata, friendship. Because they were equal. But the relationship between upper and lower castes, whether among, within Hinduism or Islam, or indeed Christianity, because those parties are unequal, that relationship can only be one of seva, of service. That the upper, the, as it were, notionally upper caste should serve the lower caste. They cannot pretend that they are equal. All right. So the aim of Khilafat was mitrata, by excluding self-interest and putting in its place sacrifice, self-sacrifice. Right. That's one example. And you might say the Khilafat ended in disaster, but it, in a way it's one of the longest lived of Gandhi's movements and the most successful. In that sense, all of Gandhi's movements ended in disaster. Disaster is the wrong word for it. They ended because all movements end. All right. But the work they did was uh, survived. Um, the other uh, two brief examples I'm going to give here, which are very interesting. One has to do, you know, in the great Calcutta killings and in their aftermath. When Gandhi, you know, famously goes on a fast and all the rest, right? And he, do you remember, um, uh, he, because this is now part of, global culture since Attenborough's film, you know, the, the, he tells the, uh, 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 one of the participants of the riots that he, who has lost his son, that he must bring up a Muslim orphan as a Muslim, you know. This, uh, so during this period of violence, uh, where Gandhi is going around and telling people they must return to their homes, and he's looking at a particular neighborhood in which Muslims have been expelled and some killed, and there is a group of what today you might call Hindu militants uh, who come to him and say, um, sorry, who come to Gandhi and say, we agree with you, but what we would like is to have arms. Why? Because not all of us have agreed with you. And we have pledged to protect the Muslims in this neighborhood of Calcutta. But if our own brothers come, we need to fight them. And Believe it or not, Gandhi says, good, he's happy, he's delighted. This for him is an instantiation of the Gita after all. You must sacrifice your own. All right? uh, it is your own brothers you must fight, uh, etc. Uh, this logic is made more powerful in 1948 with the first Indo-Pakistani war of Kashmir. Right? So Gandhi obviously doesn't like war, but just as he thinks morality is possible everywhere if it is to be anything, just as morality must be possible on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, so too it must be possible in the Indo-Pakistan war. All right? And he says, initially of course he's very displeased that Nehru takes the matter to the UN. He says, this is just like British mediation. This is how interests are created. You have the state, in which claims to be a neutral third party, and it deals between people. All right? It mediates, it does all of these things. 
So what the British have been doing in our own country, now you're going to get the UN to do globally. What will happen? What will happen is that Hindus and Muslims will never learn to confront each other in an unmediated fashion. They will rely upon the strength of others. They will never honestly take responsibility for themselves. And therefore, violence will be perpetual in the sub Indian subcontinent. Because all, just like doctors and lawyers, remember, even the most homely example becomes the most uh, refined one, right, in Gandhi. Just as if you take pills for your indigestion, you will just perpetuate your condition. You will just relieve it from time to time, and you will become a slave to modern medicine, all right? Uh, so too, the mediation of the United Nations will only mean that the two sides are kept apart, and you will have low-grade violence forever. The problem will never be solved. Against, as Gandhi said, it's better to fight. It's better to have a war. You might think how extraordinary he is, the apostle of nonviolence. But Gandhi was not a pacifist. He was a he was he was a he was a apostle of nonviolence. But for him, that did not mean that was not the same thing as pacifism, because pacifism would exclude self-sacrifice, for instance, or sacrifice of one's own. And Gandhi's great heroes, think of them: Harish Chandra, who nearly kills his wife and son; Prahlad, who in fact commits or is participant to parricide. Remember, Narasimha comes down, etc. Arjuna, of course, who kills his own relatives. All right? um, that is the ideal. That is the moral ideal for Gandhi. Uh, and he says, the Indo-Pakistani Indo war is actually a wonderful opportunity. War is bad. But if morality is universal, it must be available even on the battlefield. How is it available? He says, look at Sheikh Abdullah in Kashmir. He's a Muslim. He and his fellow Muslims are protecting Hindus and Sikhs in Kashmir by fighting their own brothers in faith from Pakistan. <coughs> this is the spirit of the Gita. They fight their brothers. They fight those to whom they are closest in some ways. The, what he considered the teaching of the Gita, uh, which he recognized as being about violence as a form of intimacy, not of foreignness, not of strangeness. The Gita was never used by Indian thinkers, Tilak is one of them, a great one, to think about the link, relations between, between the British and Indians. The British were not intimate. They could never be like the Kauravas. They might be like Ravan in another vision, right? When you're thinking about the Ramayana. But the thing about the Gita and about conflict is that it's internal, it's domestic, it's about what happens within Indian civilization and how, and it teaches you how to think about and how to address it. It's because of the intimacy that violence and nonviolence are linked to each other and that link makes possible the conversion of violence into nonviolence. Right. I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> Professor, before you end, may I request you also to touch upon this very profound relationship between Gandhi and Frontier Gandhi and what it signifies for India of today and South Asia of today, because you know, that is something that you know you had uh, explained in, in a very profound way when we had a discussion, and that is something that is perhaps left out of your talk today. So if you could kindly deal with that that part of it, that's my request. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's on now. Who is, of course, a fascinating character. Um,
went on for over 20 years continuously. The frontier, because it was the frontier between India and Palestine, was subject to different laws than British and Russia, much harsher laws, far more important. So the punishments that were meted out to the French were not so the ventures. There's a certain poetic irony to the fact that of, of them all, it had to be a Patan, a Muslim, who was the, in Gandhi's eyes, apart from himself, the only one. You know too that uh, the government of the frontier was a Congress government. Uh, into 1947, uh, there was a referendum which the Congress uh, abstained as it turned out, probably foolishly abstained from, uh, which gave the Muslim League its mandate. But when independence came and the frontier was given to Pakistan, on the day of independence in Peshawar, the tricolor was raised, not the Pakistan, not the crescent and star. And Jinnah, of course, immediately um, <coughs> dismissed the government of Dr. Khan Sahib, Ghaffar uh, Khan's brother, and replaced it. But that movement has continued to this day. Until recently, uh, the Awa Awami National Party you know, were running Peshawar. You know, when they won the elections, it's the oldest political party in Pakistan, by the way, right? this party, which was part of the Congress. When they won in the post-Musharraf period, um, I went to the website, and sure enough, pictures of Gandhi. And I mean, I was astounded. It's a Pakistani political party. But it goes to show that these links are actually, they're not tokenistic. Uh, when Ghaffar Khan died, you know, he had been put in prison by many Pakistani generals. When he died, it was at the height of the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan, right? The fight, you know, between the Americans and the with Saudi funding and the Pakistanis on the one hand and the Soviets in Afghanistan on the other. On the day of the funeral, uh, there was a truce. There was a lull in fighting. The border opened, and the funeral cortege went, crossed over from Pakistan into Afghanistan. Rajiv Gandhi, who was prime minister, went to Jalalabad. For the, so in the, it is like the Gita, you know, in the midst of the war, of one of the great wars of our time, this man, who people had forgotten, who had become nothing, the frontier Gandhi, managed to stop the war, at least for a day or two. Right? And the Indian prime minister went there to Jalalabad. Uh, extraordinary situation. It also reminds me of the fact that, you know, when Gandhi was counseling or appearing to counsel war between India and Pakistan, I've always thought of how it is that in India Indo Pakistani relations, the wars between them have been the most civilized of their encounters. Every military analyst will tell you that the Indo Pakistani wars, of course, they are reprehensible as wars, no one wants one. But in our time, when wars routinely go out of control and flout the laws of war, these wars have always been, as an Indian admiral once told me, textbook exercises. Fought outside civilian areas for the most part. The only partial exception is, of course, 71, the Pakistani civil war and India's role in the freedom of Bangladesh. Fought outside civilian areas for the most part and replete with instances of honor and glory. You know, of Indian and Pakistani generals who knew each other, um, who had drinks with you know, you know the stories, I don't need to tell you. Ironically, it's the wars that have been the most regulated, rule-bound, and moral 
of links between India and Pakistan. Terrorism, of course, is not. All right. uh, the vi vi domestic violence, both in Pakistan and India, is unregulated and excessive. But the international violence between them is, you know, full marks, as it were, you know, in terms of how to, how to wage a war. It's, it's one of those great paradoxes, like the paradox of Ghaffar Khan and his death. Right? It took the death of the man to still hostilities. It took the death of Gandhi to still hostilities in India as well. Right? When, um, uh, even when Gandhi was on his last great fast in Delhi, you know, since I've been reading the collected works, it's interesting, a lot of letters he got from Pakistan, from Muslims in Pakistan, saying, Mahatma Ji, please give up your fast, we pledge. Now you think to yourself, they belong to another country now. Why are they so interested? He should be their enemy. Why are Pakistani Muslims writing and saying, we pledged, and indeed it happened, right? When Gandhi's fast stilled violence, both in India and Pakistan, by the way, not just in India, and his death did the same. It might have been temporary, like Ghaffar Khan's death, stopped a war. But a frail old man in both cases, two frail old men who every historians say had been were finished, were politically finished by that time, that Gandhi was no longer a person of importance. That might be the case politically, but morally, look what happened. The fast and the death of Gandhi and the death of Ghaffar Khan stopped huge violence in more than one country, in both cases. Pakistan and Afghanistan in the case of Ghaffar Khan and India and Pakistan in the case of Gandhi. I think there is something to learn uh, from this. Um, and and to what, what there is to learn is to, I think, understand that even in a place like a battlefield, which appears to be the site of the most fearsome brutality, nonviolence is possible. Yes, well, you know, he, in a way, this is of the essence of morality, right? That if it's all about implementation and control, then it's no longer moral uh, because it doesn't respect the freedom of and the sovereignty of individuals. Um, and it's true that Gandhi thought of himself as having been a failure at the end. And he would constantly say, what is the point of everything I've done if I am to die a failure? Um, a businessman who dies bankrupt is not a good business. You know, he used these banya, these uh, commercial analogies all the time. Uh, um, because he was true to himself and his background. It's uh, very interesting. So implementation might not be the right word. It's a, it's a long and difficult task. But I think what Gandhi saw was that it could not be otherwise. In other words, given the reality of Indian society as he saw it, which was not defined entirely by contract and interest, it could not be. Right. Um, part, for many reasons, partly because of the colonial state, partly because it was not a fully capitalized society, uh, partly because so many human relations in the society continue to be not defined by contract and things like that. Um, whether it's a joint family, whether it is any number of things. So for Gandhi, it wasn't like, isn't this a wonderful ideal and we should strive for it? It wasn't a wonderful ideal. It was the reality of India. You couldn't get rid of it. What you could do was try to elaborate it and expand it. And non, that's what nonviolence was about. He thought India had a great role in the world uh, to demonstrate this. 
he didn't deny the reality of violence either. After all, remember, he thought that violence and non-violence were interconnected. But his wager, I think, was this, that he was going to go with the, what he considered to be the reality of Indian society. In Hind Swaraj, you know, the, you know Hind Swaraj is a dialogue, right, between a reader and an editor. And Gandhi is, as it were, the role of the editor. And at one point, the reader, who is objecting, and the reader is, a, in quotes, a terrorist, um, and uh, though he's actually more complex than that, and who says, look, why shouldn't we free India by violence? and etc etc and Gandhi's response is fine if you want to do this then what's the difference between you and the British then why not just keep them here because this famously says you want the tiger's nature without the tiger you in fact what you want to do is become the British you want to simply take the place of the British you want everything that they have but you want it so then why not just have them they are better at doing it than we are uh, if that is your desire, then I don't want freedom of this kind. Right. India has something else to contribute to the world. And India's freedom must be true to India's civilization and her nature. And that is what drove him. He thought that the attempt to make India like England was actually not just doing violence to the civilization, but would actually shake the society far more uh, than what he recommended. But of course, it's a great struggle. And as I tried to point out, there are many valid things to be said on, on more than one side. So when I mentioned what, say, Ambedkar and Jinnah argued, they were not, their arguments are not without merit. They were quite, they were rational arguments. I happened to think Gandhi's were preferable. Um, and I compared Iqbal to some degree with him. I Iqbal also realizes um, that as he puts it in one of his speeches, this is a society at that time overwhelmingly rural, which is not defined by what he calls the money economy. How can a form of European style nationalism, which is all about middle class attitudes and contracts and representation, have any real reality in this society? How can you ignore what the vast majority of Indians uh, are, how they live? how they think and how they, what informs their behavior. That is not simply to do violence to them. It is to violate the society itself and to, uh, to, make, to have it become prey to even more violence. Uh, so there are a number of things that are jostling there with Gandhi. Right? Uh, we don't want to just become second class Europeans. Uh, not only because we don't like that, but also because that would even make that would make for even more violence uh, and what does it mean to be true to India it's not a concluded project clearly yes it works I just want to ask you that you have always been immersed in study of philosophy and uh, this whole business about Gandhi losing popularity within South Asia is contrasted with the very obvious and popularity of Gandhi practically across the world. We have a lot of Hollywood movies using a very caricature of Gandhi, including Fight Club, for example. Mm. Uh, I was just wondering, is it because the Western philosophy would often see that we, it stutters at the moral imperial, you know, the, the, the Kantian moral imperial, what is moral uh, values and uh, I remember at least one episode where Kant has asked if you are true that the moral imperative is so imperative to in human nature then how is it that the good people often suffer and this is what I seem to remember is when, that is probably when Kant said that is one reason I would like to believe in reincarnation now, in that sense of the term he stretches the, the philosophic uh, idea beyond a lifetime hmm. No, I mean, it doesn't make it the short span way of thinking, which seems to be the plaguing nearly every Western thought beyond in, in what we call philosophy. And since the Westphalian agreement, we see very often all foreign, in, foreign policies of all nature are so severely defined by this idea called self-interest, which is almost holy by now. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just wondering, is there an interest in Gandhi in terms of a philosophic reassessment of his work? I'm not talking about the caricature of Gandhi. But that is why he makes it, he make, becomes a very easy target for attack in the sense of holding his nephews and his celibacy and his fights with his bodily functions. And then a very high take on morality. Morality seems to have lost some of its uh, forcefulness and perhaps the ethical acts is what I would imagine he mm -hmm. has always fought and tried to confirm. But I would like to know if there, are, there is a renewed interest in philosophy of Gandhi as opposed to, you know, the, just the, the character driven love or hate yes. of Gandhi. Please introduce okay. yourself. <coughs> introduce yourself. Oh, I am Harish Nambia. I think you're right. I mean, it's there is there is a a, a new interest in Gandhi. At the same time, of course, as there there is a huge increase in uh, the denigration on and attacks on Gandhi, the denigration of and attacks on Gandhi, um, and they are part of the same logic. Uh, you know, I always uh, tell people that we should be thankful to Gandhi's enemies rather than his friends, uh, because. Uh, by taking Gandhi as an enemy, they recognize that Gandhi still lives, you know, that he's, he's not being consigned to oblivion. You know? um, whereas often it's Gandhi's admirers who make him into a caricature as well. Right? You know, the Obama version of Gandhi. We like hearing it, but in fact it's a, you know, a platitude. It's platitudinous. Um, so there is that. There is an interest, and it is on philosophy. Um, because the scholarship of the past, much a lot of historical scholarship was itself defined by ideas of self-interest, right? So people could only act because of their interests. Right? As I was saying with Khilafat, what did Gandhi want? Well, he wanted to get the Muslims on board so he could get rid of the British. So he made a deal with them about they were foolishly you know, interested in the caliphate and Gandhi joined them. No one ever asked why they were foolishly <laughs> interested in the caliphate. That destroys the logic of self-interest suddenly. Right? Basically, you could only say they're fanatics, which, whether it or not it's true, also destroys the logic of self-interest. Uh, so that kind of historic, ex historical explanation, no doubt, will continue, but it's being marginalized um, uh, in the current work, uh, I think. Uh, but the, um, the uh, uh, thing about what you said about reincarnation, I think, is very, very interesting. Because, of course, if you have a, if you have a theory of transmigration, self-interest no longer has meaning in the sense that, uh, that Western moral philosophy uh, uh, thinks. And, um, but you know how this works is very interesting. I was discussing with Mr. Kulkarni earlier how um, you know, in Savarkar's uh, important text, Essentials of Hindutva, you know, he, has a, uh, he, he has a number of definitions of what it means to be Indian. And one of them has to do with uh, that those who own India as their Pitra Bhumi, as their fatherland, and as their Punya Bhumi, as their holy land, are Indians. And ostensibly, but only ostensibly, this would mean that Christians and Muslims who have holy lands outside India are not, etc. Except, of course, it's always more complicated than that. Uh, so when Savarkar then comes across uh, these Muslim communities like the Khojas and the Boras who actually believe in Vishnu, for instance, uh, suddenly that whole logic goes awry, right? Uh, and I was telling Mr. Gulkarni earlier that <coughs> Hussein Ahmed Madni, who was the rector of the Deoband Seminary and who was um, a, a, a great critic of the Pakistan idea, um, in a kind of commentary on Savarkar says, well, actually, you know, it's the Muslims who truly own India as their Pitra Bhumi and their Punya Bhumi. How? Because, after all, they are buried in the soil of India, and their saints are in the soil of India. For them, the soil of India is sacred, whereas for the Hindus, then he refers to transmigration. Because they believe in transmigration, they can come from anywhere and go anywhere else. So for them, India is not very special. <laughs> it's a joke. But notice the, the, um, it's a joke, but notice the subtlety of it. Because what he's not saying is that those who believe in transmigration are wrong. He's not saying that. He's not saying that that's doctrinally wrong and this is right. He's saying he's taking two visions of the world. One, that you have one life. And the other is that you have more than one. 
or you have transmigration. And he's saying, let's weigh these two, not to suggest which is right and which is wrong, but to note its implication, the implications of that belief. Uh, so even in a joking way, there is great subtlety involved. And that is so true of so many people of that period. Iqbal, when he writes his famous uh, early Persian work, the Asrar-e Khudi, The Secrets of the Self, the entire Urdu, it's a Persian work, right? The entire Urdu introduction is about the Bhagavad Gita, in which he says, now you might think this is for a largely Muslim audience, not even in India, but also outside India, in Iran and Afghanistan. And he says, the Bhagavad Gita is the most sublime philosophy of action ever devised. There is nothing superior to it. And then he goes on to compare uh, Shankara and Ramanujam. Now, you think to yourself, what the hell is going on? The great philosopher and poet of Muslim India in a Persian work spends pages of his introduction writing not only about the Gita and Krishna. He says Krishna is the greatest exemplar of the philosophy of action. There is nothing superior to this in the whole philosophical world. Not content with that, he goes on to discuss the individual merits of Shankara and Ramanujan. There are many surprises that meet us in these texts. So I mentioned Savarkar is one, Iqbal is another. Um, and it is this that we tend not to attend to. Uh, scholars tend not to do it and others tend not to do it. Uh, but my feeling is that, and I tell this to my students in Oxford, that all of these people and texts have gone into the making of modern India. You cannot pretend that they haven't. Jinnah is as much part of the history of modern India as Gandhi. Similarly, Gandhi is, is as much part of the identity of Pakistan as is Jinnah. To ignore this is to do violence. Uh, and one must actually try to read these figures. You don't have to agree with them. You might agree with some and not with others. But one has to acknowledge uh, their existence and also, I think, recognize that in their own way, each made some kind of contribution to the political thought that has made this country and its neighbors what they are, for good or for ill. Uh, to exclude any one of them is not to be is to betray ourselves, I think. Uh, and the. Uh, I'm not sure the sound is coming very well from your mind. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll speak. So I'll speak out a little louder. Yeah. I don't know how I, how I can articulate it because it's a very difficult issue that you raised. You spoke earlier in your speech about how we felt that morality, if it is to be real morality, lies outside history. That the pursuit of history, whether personally or in groups, is in a sense self-defeating that it leads to evil. Now it struck me that if you have a system where you don't have times, where you don't work in accordance with times arrow, that you live outside history, you are, your actions are in a sense directionless. And perhaps, perhaps that, that's one of the reasons we have a very curious process of the movement towards Indian independence. I mean, left, right. In many ways, directionless, but of course, eventually it did reach an end. How could you translate directionless, historyless movements in a world in an independent India? where we are working towards, we have to work towards goal. How would Gandhi have, have dealt with that? Yes, um, th that is indeed an, you know, a crucial question. And I would begin to respond to it by saying that what Gandhi was doing, I think, was simply one of the things he was doing was simply recognizing that there are large swathes of human life which are not determined by instrumental actions alone. And there are great sites, 
such as the battlefield of Kurukshetra, in which this logic, he thought, could not operate. So his point was, how do you actually look at these, as it were, directionless, these moments where direction is not even possible, where you have to make a decision on some other basis, say duty, dharma, right? If you recognize, A, that they exist, they exist within families, between lovers, they exist on battlefields, they exist in many different places, what do you make of them? How do you factor them into any theory of social relations? On the assumption that you can't just wipe them away. So that was one of his wagers, that these sorts of relations existed. Uh, yeah. uh, some, I don't know, perhaps it's because I am where I'm sitting. Sorry, I can stand there. Is that? The issues Gandhi was dealing with, as I said, was that these kinds of directionless uh, relations were in fact the stuff of social reality, that they existed, whether we like them or not. That they existed between lovers, between parents and uh, children, in families, on the battlefield, etc. Because Arjuna's whole, the point of Arjuna for him is that he can't make a decision on the basis of anything else but his duty. So how do you actually deal with this reality? That's one of Gandhi's wagers. The other one I think is that he spent his life struggling to make morality, to place politics in the shadow of morality. But he didn't do so, I think, in such a way as to pretend that instrumental action was not possible or that one could get rid of it altogether. What I find, in other words, you know, so Gandhi also has constructive work that is direction, that's about direction, you know, that's about doing something in the cause of an end. Uh, as was the national movement eventually. But what he realizes is that nothing could begin in that manner. That in the early days of the national struggle, it was impossible to think in terms only of self-interest and of victory. The, the odds were against it. Not only because of the might of the British, but for Gandhi, more important, the Indians wanted them there. Right? That is his thing. Remember what I started out with that Hindus and Muslims fight because it's a luxury for them. Or he says, we want them here because we like consumer goods. You know, we want there, we want all of this stuff. Um, so the struggle was against great odds and it could not be defined by self-interest and by directionality in, in the conventional sense. So there too you have to take it into consideration. So he says all religions begin with sacrifice and they end with self-interest, right? Um, uh, but of course he was not against directionality altogether. So there's constructive work, there is his work, you know, you know Gandhi pronounces upon legal matters, uh, you know, has one opinion about something and another about something else. But for him I think it's a very, um, there's a constant struggle between these two principles. They must coexist. He's also interesting because he doesn't, he, he wants, he sees these, uh, fault lines running across society and he doesn't think that you can somehow erase them and create a smooth social space where everything is the same. That you must live with the fault lines and you must constantly go back and forth you know, if you recognize the reality of, of Indian society. But what strikes me as being interesting and I think this is the great wager in terms of his context Remember Gandhi in the 20s and 30s, he is writing and speaking and acting at a time of, the, of great ideological movements around the world, fascism and communism in particular, but even liberalism to some degree. All these great new ideological movements are driven by the future, are driven by utopia to come, and they're driven by it in such a manner as to sacrifice the means for the ends as we know with Stalin, with Mao, etc. Right? And Gandhi is the sole person I can think of, of that stature, who disregards the future and the future utopia, who also disregards history. These movements are all about history, right? Whether it's Marx with its modes of production or whether it is um, Mussolini and Hitler with their racial past, right? Gandhi wants to live fully in the present. It's an extraordinary gambit. You know, he, in a way, he's telling himself, he's not telling everyone to do it. How is it possible to just inhabit the present fully, not to make the present into simply a conduit to the future, not to sacrifice 
what it is to be in the present. And I think it's abstract, of course, because I'm interested in these things, but in comparison with his peers around the world, um, Gandhi is extraordinary because he rejects the utopian future and he rejects the historical past and he focuses more than anyone else on the present and in that sense he is the most contemporary figure because he really inhabits the present and he thinks morality is only possible in it. You know, Gandhi, I think, thought that, you know, when we talk about self-interest, we think about it as being natural, right? That somehow it belongs to all of us. But he, in a way, I think, thought the reverse. He thought it takes a great deal of work to make people self-interested. Uh, that it takes regulation, it takes institutional discipline and regulation to make people into this. Let me give you an example. Um, because I vivid, I examined a thesis by an Indian student um, not so long ago in Oxford, and he was writing about uh, Delhi. You know, once Delhi is made into the capital of India, 1911, what happens and how these things happen. So it's about property, but it is very interesting because the colonial state has to wants to create a market in property. How do they do it? There is no natural market. We think the market is natural, but the point is that. In the wake of the mutiny, uh, in a situation where property is not regulated by commercial considerations alone, what does it mean to have a market value for property? How do the British do this? They set up auctions. Auctions, property auctions. Now, of course, we all know that auctions, you know, they are limited in all kinds of ways. But once you have, once you auction property, you automatically set a price, right? So that now you know what the market value is. It doesn't pre-exist. It's an institutional endeavor that produces it. And therefore, it, a market is created within which certain kinds of interests have meaning. So it's a small example, but it suggests, I think, that the self-interested individual uh, is a product of institutions of a certain kind. And what Gandhi thought institutions could do as well is to allow they don't they can't create this interest but they can allow it to reemerge uh, just as the family as an institution not only allows it it encourages this interest it encourages sacrifice self sacrifice otherwise how can families hold together this interest yeah. yes this interest yeah my name is dr rajesh and i have a small question for you uh, imagine for a moment, uh, if Mahatma Gandhi and Frontier Gandhi are sent back to India and Park by God today to finish unfinished work, where you will place them in present Indian and Park society and what will be their relevance? Well, that's a difficult question, but yeah. if, 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 uh, Suppose God gives Mahatma Gandhi and Frontier Gandhi a second life and send packs to India and Pakistan to finish the unfinished work. Where you will put them in present India and Pakistan society and what will be their relevance in present modern world? Well, uh, let me just go back, since I'm a historian I always deal with the past rather than the future, but uh, uh, you know when Gandhi was assassinated of course you know that he was on his way to Pakistan, right? He was going on a Padhyatra. Why was he going? He was going in order to do in Pakistan what he had done in India. He did not want Hindus and Sikhs to be thrown out. Um, uh, of course, they eventually were thrown. I mean, you know, the country is ethnically cleansed. Right? I mean, there's less than 1% Hindu population in Pakistan. Um, it used to be a very large number. Uh, yes. And... Um, uh, he had been welcomed, you know, people had invited him from Pakistan. But Gandhi said, it's very interesting, he said, fine, you can have partition if that's what you want. I can't prevent it. But 
there will be no peace between these countries if those who have been expropriated and expelled are not given the right to return and to reclaim their properties. They, in a hundred years there will never be any peace. It's not about government to government uh, uh, relations. Those can be good. It's a moral issue uh, that whether they are willing to do it or not, Hindus and Sikhs must be not just allowed back but welcomed back and their properties must be restored to them. There must be, it must be clear that a home awaits them there, that that is also their home. So he went to Pakistan to tell Hindus and Sikhs He thinks that he's freeing both India and Pakistan. It's a bizarre. Gandhi recognizes this as being an idealistic, and Jinnah thought he was a realist. Gandhi recognized that Jinnah was an idealist. You know, that he thought that you could actually do these things um, and and have them work. Uh, but to get back uh, to question, it's it's uh, it's um, this whole idea that the minority must exist, the home must exist in the place that has been vacated. Uh, that if Hindus and Sikhs do not have, those who have come from there, do not have the possibility of return, there can be no peace. And I wonder if he was not correct, that it's not about confidence building measures and military agreements, uh, but it is actually something much deeper. Uh, it is the redressal of a historical injustice uh, that might seem to be sp superficial, and might seem to be pointless, but it's precisely these kinds of things that have meaning. I was wondering how uh, Jinnah happened to hide that he had TV from the Congress and the uh, and, uh, and did Mahatma Gandhi know that uh, Jinnah had TV? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure they all thought that was, you know, he didn't look like a well person, as you know. Um, but this is one of those questions that routinely comes up in the historiography. And I'm not sure what to say about it, except, you know, when I was reading the memoir of uh, Jinnah's doctor in Pakistan, the man who, you know, uh, treated him until he died, it's, what's extraordinary about it is that he, when he finally, you know, Jinnah goes to Ziyarat, right, in Baluchistan too. When he goes and examines Jinnah, so this was a doctor, a Muslim doctor, who, of course, because the Second World War had just concluded, he had been serving in Europe and elsewhere. He says, the emaciation, he says, I've, this kind of body I've only seen among like concentration camp survivors and people. 
Arjuna. Um, it's the violence that he, it wasn't simply his illness, you know, it's his pushing himself and refusal to eat and all of this, that there is a degree of, to return to the question of sacrifice, uh, a degree of sacrifice there as well uh, with Jinnah of a different kind from Gandhi's, the punishing of the self, um, the man who decides to wear the most uncomfortable clothes for the Indian climate, uh, the man who's obsessive in filling out receipts, turning off lights, uh, uh, you know, who, who presents, who acts the part of a European gentleman without really being it. Jinnah was as vernacular as Gandhi. Right? They were both Gujaratis, as you know. And Jinnah's English was not as good as Gandhi's. It was filled with incorrect, you know, he, 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 he fooled people because people think that Jinnah was so westernized. But Jinnah did not grow up speaking English. So, sorry, it had departed from your question. But I just wanted to suggest that the issue of Jinnah's illness tells us as much about his own forms of obsession and sacrifice as they do about, you know, uh, about what could, uh, the possibility of what could have happened if he were to have uh, lived longer uh, or lived for a shorter time. I mean, I suppose it, it might be possible to say that had Jinnah died before partition, it could not have, it might not have happened. Uh. I don't know. I mean, you know, there were people who said, like Lord Wavell, who was Viceroy before Mountbatten, thought that, you know, both Jinnah and Gandhi had to die for, the, for India to be free properly. He didn't want to, uh, I mean, he was partial to the idea of Pakistan to some degree, uh, but, uh, uh, and he thought they'd lived well past their time. But then he, of course, being English, was much more uh, able to get along with someone like Nehru. Um, Jinnah, who appears to be very westernized, is in fact not. Um, we were discussing earlier that in their last great talks in 1944 here in Mumbai, Jinnah and Gandhi, they met in Jinnah's house in Mount Pleasant Road. The talks were apparently conducted in Gujarati, not in... Uh, no, uh, Jinnah was from uh, Gondal state and Gandhi from Porbandar. Uh, yeah, yeah.
as I said, he was not a pacifist, so he didn't really mind blood flowing as long as it was done righteously. As long as it was absolutely necessary and done righteously, right? not, not for any reason at all. So that would not have, I think, moved it. He used to say over and over again, I'm willing to sacrifice a million lives, starting with my own. Um, but you know, God said, you're right. God says, quote from speech, uh, a text of great interest. And you will recall, having read it, that it's so psychologically uh, involved. Uh, you know, God says, says uh, Gandhi, again, the trope of betrayal. Gandhi is betraying us, us Hindus, Indians. Uh, he has become a part of Pakistan. Uh, nevertheless, I respect Gandhi. Before shooting him, I touched his feet. Uh, he calls him Gandhi to out. Right? So it's a very curious, it's a really remarkable text. I teach it. I think the God says God. What does it mean for this? Uh, he's taking his father. God say, right? And in killing Gandhi, he describes Gandhi as his father. He touches his feet. He has betrayed us. The language is entirely one of family and intimacy. He has become the father of someone else, as opposed to our father. Uh, in killing Gandhi, he makes Gandhi into the father of the nation. All right? Um, it's. Um, and you know Gandhi had wanted it. It's almost like there's a secret link between Godse and Gandhi. Because Gandhi for months before his assassination suspected that he was going to be killed and he wanted to be killed. He wanted his blood to flow. Um, and Godse had tried it before and you know Gandhi met him and tried to chat with him. And didn't ask for him to be arrested or anything like that. So I think the assassination uh, you know, Gandhi would say that if I die without fear in my heart, etc., then I will be proved correct. And so it's almost as if there's, this, as I said, a secret agreement between Gandhi and Godse. You can see it in Gandhi's words, and you can see it in Godse's words. Um, and that famous Marathi play, um, yes, which is, which explores which explores these things. Uh, one can't say as a historian. You know what would or would not have happened uh, in terms of nonviolence. Gandhi, of course, had his argument about why, and I, I, I elaborated a bit of it, uh, where he said, "Look, the the kind of country we want is not simply a second grade, second rate European country, uh, a country that has been built upon violence. The, what be the, what's the point of freedom if that's the kind of freedom uh, uh, we have?" So I'm not. Um, how should I put it? I can't address the question of whether or not Gandhi's Ahimsa delayed independence or made it uh, more bloodthirsty, um, but only to note the curious set of relations that Gandhi, that Gandhi and Godse had uh, with one another. But also to note that you know, we, we are constantly in a tragic mode when we think about partition and independence. But when you think about post-colonial countries, I would say India is the most successful among them. No country has emerged from imperialism with India's success. I mean, this is a country which uh, has been has never had a military dictatorship, which has been democratic. Um, which has innovated, which has maintained its territorial integrity and sovereignty, um, and which has been, even when Indi you know, India's greatest achievements on the global stage were at a time when it had no power or money. Um, and I'm not talking only about non-alignment, I'm talking about the Suez crisis, I'm talking about the way in which the UN, UN was reformed in its earliest days um, because of actions taken by people like Hansa Mehta, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, etc. Right? It's, yeah. it's not a question, it's just a kind of concern which is coming from this type of uh, reactions which, uh, as she said, she referred to net and even the younger generation, if you look today, I am a teacher, I am a lecturer, so I confront, I teach Gandhism and I have most of the students who are in the class are against them. They are only 
Red Gold say maybe more than Gandhi himself. So this is where I feel uh, what, how can we inculcate you know, this uh, interest in Gandhi and the ideology of Gandhi, how do we put it forth in front of the society because I feel even today Gandhi is much more relevant than what he was at that time. Even in today's time, I think Gandhi can be implemented and he, you know, his ideologies can still prove to be effective. So, how can we, you know, judge, I mean, how can you solve, resolve this conflict between Gandhi and Gorsi sort of? I mean, I... Just since you, your own stock goes back to the Gujarati soil and somehow Gandhi and Jinnah both come from Gujarat and Ambedkar too had the Maharaja of Baroda helping him. I'm just wondering why is it that Gandhi is most wiped out, least popular in Gujarat rather than any other state in India? You know, uh, uh, it's true of course that um, uh, uh, there's a lot to be done in terms of teaching or inculcating or exploring Gandhi. He doesn't have, you know, one doesn't even have to agree with him to do that. But what I've been struck by is that you're right. There's a lot of anti-Gandhi sentiment in India, more than, the, you know, perhaps ever before. But at the same time, Indian politics cannot be thought without him, even by his enemies. Um, all great movements, all the great mobilizations of India's independent history have taken for good or for ill Gandhi as their model. All right. Um, whether it's Medha Patkar and the Narbada Bachao Andolan, whether it is um, uh, JP, I would even say whether it is Advani's Ratyatra, inconceivable without the salt march and the great processions. You know, um, whether he's invoked consciously or not to say nothing of Anahazare, which is explicit. All right, but even when it's not explicit, it's there. The forms of mobilization, forms of doing politics, the rhetoric, uh, the political rhetoric, some of it, uh, of Indian politics, is stamped and marked by Gandhi, uh, whether you agree with it or not. And so he remains a living figure. All the women's movements especially have been marked by Gandhi in one way or the other. So I see these two things happening together simultaneously. On the one hand, the uh, depreciation and the criticism of Gandhi, on the other hand, the inability to actually exit his world. Uh, but that's what, um, you know, Ashish Nandi uh, said something like, um, the, the thing about Gandhi is, as with Godse, to go back to that, um, every Indian has to deal with Gandhi as the father, as a figure of the father. And the, the relationship between the father and the child is always a problematic one. Uh, and Gandhi himself was fully conscious of it. You know, and again in Hind Swaraj, uh, he has this wonderful example where the interlocutor says, look, imagine that India is a house and some, a thief is breaking into your house. Wouldn't you use violence against the thief? And what does Gandhi say? He says, imagine if the thief was your father. <laughs> now, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, what would you do then? Would you, so he's, again, he's, he's, it's a joke, but it's a subtle joke, right? He's saying these, uh, these imaginary, these examples. India is not a house, right? That's a metaphor. Since you're using a metaphor, I'm, he says, I'm going to draw your attention to the metaphorical nature of this. That you're incapable, it's not possible to think about politics without metaphors. You can't have it. So you have a metaphor, let me add one, let me twist it a bit. What if the thief was your father? Would you be really ashamed and embarrassed and shut your eyes and not do anything? Right? <coughs> then the other thing. What if the child, the, the guy says, what if uh, in support of terrorism, you know, India is going to the dogs because of the British and the Indians are heedless, so you have to, have, you have to uh, perform acts of violence to save the child. And Gandhi says, say the child rushing into a fire. And Gandhi says in Hind Swaraj, what if the child was bigger and stronger than you were, right? So again, this kind of, it's again the father and the child, right? Would you... If you couldn't prevent the child, because it was bigger than you, from going to the fire, would you sacrifice yourself? Why not sacrifice yourself? If you sacrifice yourself, then you will teach the child. If you're sacrificing the child, uh, then you have to, you know, there's something. So there are fathers and children everywhere in Gandhi, who of course is Bapu, who is the father, 
All right. But he's also Mohan, he's also the child god. Uh, and one has to pay, I think, great attention to the verbiage, the vocabulary, the rhetoric, and not only go for the obvious meanings, because it's all these things, even in God's speech, uh, I love and respect Gandhiji, he's my father, I saluted him and touched his feet before I shot him, he's become someone else's father. It's a quarrel between different sons and fathers. Right? Uh, and that's where the reality of Gandhi lies even today. We have to come to terms with it, I think. Just two more minutes, friends. Uh, in response to what you said and what Professor responded to it, let me add that uh, even the BJP's manifesto released yesterday, it refers to Mahatma Gandhi twice. So, <laughs> politics in India cannot ignore Mahatma Gandhi. You know, I am provoked to make uh, two observations. You know, the original idea that I learned from uh, Professor Devji, uh, first from his book and now from his talk, is that non-violence has no history. It's violence that has history. Uh, a difficult idea to understand, but uh, Reading Gandhi and trying to understand Gandhi, you know, we, we know how true it is. There is a place, of course, very famous, where Gandhiji says that truth and non-violence are as old as hills. Hmm? So hills, you know, they have no human history. Hmm? So he places truth and non-violence outside history, you know, that is his genius, that he is, he is trying to confront today's realities by, by approaching them from values that are outside history, that are eternal, that are in fact part of a cosmic order. This is one truly great thought that uh, I think uh, we all learned from professor's talk today. The other is, you know, since uh, the, the title of today's talk is, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, Hinduism, Islam, non-violence, you know, all religions of the world, they, they speak to the individual. They speak less to the collective they speak to the individual and which is what is true even about Gandhiji's philosophy hmm? that the individual is sovereign you know sovereignty you know it is it's a modern concept that the sovereignty rests with the nation hmm? but for it, for Gandhi the individual can be inherently independent hmm? and that is the concept of Swaraj you know, Gandhi, you know, in fact goes to the, the extreme position to say that you, I, don't have, I don't have to see India becoming independent for me to be independent. I can be independent irrespective of the external circumstance. So Swaraj must begin with me. So the, the, the emphasis on individual that I must change that I must change for the world to change hmm? and I must change even if the world doesn't change you know this is this is such a a universal universal moral message hmm? which is why you know 
Gandhi ji is uh, uh, he he'll continue to be contemporary. He'll continue to be relevant. You know, it 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 really doesn't matter. Uh, as as he himself said that even the criticism of Gandhi only goes to prove that he's alive. And this criticism is to be is to be not suppressed, not at all. You know, even suppression of criticism is completely un-Gandhian. Hmm? But we must engage this debate, hmm? and we must, at least those of us who who believe that uh, he has a message for India and he has a message for the world, must engage this debate, and uh, and and with respect for other points of view as he you know that he shows the professor showed in fact it was Gandhiji's own approach that respect even for Godse's point of view I mean that's the only way we can approach the truth and create a society that is non-violent that uh, is based on 